Title, Spiritual Warfare. We want to take a look at some principles that the scripture gives us dealing with fighting spiritual warfare. The first principle that we find is the promise of victory will only come to the saint that will fight. And I notice many times when I hear the things that people are dealing with, and they relate them in, way, in, in such a way as it's totally subjective, the things that they're experiencing, the overwhelming pressures and stresses that they're under, undergoing. Very seldom do I hear them speak these things with a positive view of what they're dealing with. In other words, they have a passive receptivity to the problems and the conflicts that they're engaged in. But the scripture tells us, whatever comes your way, whatever challenge you have, is you deal with it aggressively in a positive perspective. What do I mean? Turn to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 10 to 11. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 10 to 11. It tells us the attitude that we should have when we're being confronted by opposition. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So first and foremost, what we find lacking in the minds of most Christians is that they are to deal with the problem deal with the opposition in the strength of God. And the reason that they have a passive view, a submissive view, is because they're being drained because they're dealing with the problem in their own strength. And the enemy is well aware of this. Isaiah, the 14th chapter, talks about Satan going about weakening the nation, draining the resolve, draining the enemy of the energy from the human race. It's not so for God's people. We deal with our circumstances from the perspective of God's strength, not our own. And that gives us a positive view of the circumstance we're dealing with. So Paul there is saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God has equipped us to battle. God has given us weapons that we can employ. We are not without the ability to go and engage the enemy in his own turf, if you will. Turn to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 to 13. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 to 13. This should be the mindset that the saint should have when confronted by opposition. Not that I speak in respect of want or need, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So the mindset here deals with an approach that the enemy does successfully in the mind of the saint. The situation that he's in, the circumstances that he's dealing with, are always given from the perspective of them being insurmountable, overwhelming. But the scripture teaches that we are to learn to be able to deal in whatever condition, circumstance we happen to be in. Do not allow your circumstance to dictate your 
view of the circumstance. Then I speak in respect of want or need for I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Again, the strength of the Lord is the key to dealing with any and every circumstance that comes our way because the strength of the Lord is unlimited. God will give us the ability to withstand anything and all things in his strength, not ours. Turn to 2 Corinthians, 10th chapter, verse 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians, 10th chapter, verse 3 to 5. How do you perceive your challenge? 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So our focus should not be on the physical problem itself. Our focus should be on the spiritual nature of the problem solver. Our focus should be on God, not the condition, not the situation. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What we find here, the enemy gets victory if he can project insurmountable odds in the mind of an individual that's dealing with a challenge. If a person thinks he's going up against a brick wall that's insurmountable, he can't penetrate it, He's lost before he even engages. If a person looks at a problem as though it's a big mountain that is immovable, his view of the, the condition, his view of the challenge will be such that he's defeated before he even starts. The scripture here is telling us, casting down imaginations, things that the enemy will put in our mind to make the problem greater than the problem solver. Things that the enemy will put in our mind that are contrary to the word of God. Whatever it is you're dealing with, the scripture has an answer for it. And many times people are frustrated and they throw up their hands without even going into the word of God to find out what God has to say about the situation. They've already drawn the conclusion. I just can't deal with this. It's too much. It's overwhelming. And the enemy will walk right over that person's life and do whatever it is that he needs to do or wants to do to bring them into bondage to that situation. No, do not. You never, never, never watch from a human perspective, from a physical perspective, whatever it is you're dealing with. Get God's view on the situation through God's word. And then when you get God's perspective, you will see the circumstance in the way it actually exists, not as it appears to be. It will never, never, never be an insurmountable mountain or wall in your life because there are no insurmountable walls or mountains where God is concerned. Get God's perspective. It starts in your thinking. It starts in the mind. It starts with understanding the Word of God. Your senses... What you see, feel, taste, smell, and hear about the situation will give you a totally different perspective of what the challenge is than what God's word and God's view will be of it. Forget the senses. It's subjective to begin with. It's not going to give you an objective view of your situation. Get God's view, God's word, and you'll start off on the path to victory no matter what it is. You'll walk on in a renewed vigor, a renewed energy. 
that will enable you to withstand all the vicissitudes of the things of this life. Now, many times we find that problems are the result of spiritual influence. There is a spirit somewhere, directly or indirectly, influencing that particular condition. Turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, 10th chapter, verses 17 to 19. And we find that the spirit, particularly Satan, <clears throat> will come in one of two guises. He'll come as a, an allurer, as somebody that will present something that appears to be <clears throat> attractive. You come as a deceiver, painting a beautiful picture, or he'll come as a tormentor. One of the two. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 17 to 19. And here we find the relationship between the saint and all spirits, Satan included. Jesus sends out the 70 to go across the cities of Israel proclaiming the gospel. And he says, I'm sending you before me and I'll, whatever city you go into, I'll be following you. And he tells them, he gives them specific instructions about what they are to do. Picking up verse 17, when they return, and the 70 return again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. He said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, over all, A-L-L, -L, all, the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So the spirits are subject to the saint in Christ. Starting with the kingpin spirit, Satan, Lucifer. All spirits are subject to the saint in Christ. We need to understand that. When we're dealing with a spiritual influence, we can deal with it from the perspective of authority. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That thing has no right being in your life to begin with, whether it's indirect or direct. Its influence can be broken through the power of the Holy Spirit and cast aside for the saint to go on in victory. The Holy Spirit will give us understanding of the things we're dealing with from the of objective perspective. We don't have to sit still for Satan or anything that he has to bring against the people of God because he's a defeated enemy to begin with. Christians need to focus from that perspective. We hear a lot of talk about the devil this, the devil that, or the devil is on my case, and the devil made me do it. And the devil is a defeated enemy, and he knows it. And you bring that to his attention under the authority of Christ, and you speak the authority of Christ, he'll, he's not going to hang around very long. Because he knows that the game is up as far as he's concerned, and there are too many other targets of opportunity out there for him to deal with. So he won't spend much time trying to dog your steps. Stand firm. Speak the truth. Jesus, when he confronted an unclean spirit, he would always address, he would always call that specific spirit by name or by whatever the characteristic was that the spirit was imparting in the life of the individual that he was free. We do the same thing. If it's a spirit of poverty, and the scripture talks about <clears throat> spirits that come and rob, the spoiler, the devourer, spirits that come from the spiritual realm and they siphon off things, blessings that God has for his people. You address that condition, address that spirit by name, rebuke it, 
He has to pour it out of your life and watch its influence diminish. Turn to Psalms 91, verse 13. Psalms 91, verse 13. The spirits are subject to the saint. And the reason that they are so successful is because they get the saint to believe that the saint is under their influence and is powerless to do anything about it. Not so. Psalms 91, verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. If you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, the spirits are under your feet. And you do not have to sit still for any of the stuff that they would bring or try to bring into your life. You have no time for that. God wants you free to be able to serve him in the fullness of his calling that he has brought into your life. Isaiah 54, verse 17. Isaiah 54, verse 17. <coughs> no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. In every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The enemy crafts weapons to <clears throat> enter into the life of God's people to restrict, to put into bondage, and to ultimately destroy. We have the promises of the word of God that that saint that has a willingness to stand and fight, the willingness to pursue with a bulldog tenacity to dig in his heels and to aggressively come against whatever the opposition is will neutralize whatever weapon the enemy has formed to try to come against him. Scripture in Ephesians 6 chapter says you can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy, raising the shield of faith. You are guaranteed victory in every single circumstance. <laughs> Scripture teaches the saint must be spiritually aggressive at all times. You can't afford to reach a stage where you think you're not going to come under attack. The scripture teaches the saint must be alert at all times because the enemy is always there looking for an opportunity to cause some sort of problem, affliction, whatever he can do. He's looking for an opportunity to launch a weapon into the life, looking for an opportunity to put a thought into the mind of the saint, looking for an opportunity to bring the saint into a position of doubt or fear, whatever he thinks he can get away with. He must be vigilant at all times. Turn to 1 Timothy 6 chapter, verse 12. 1 Timothy 6 chapter, verse 12. This not only pertains to Timothy, this pertains to all God's saints. Fight, the good fight of faith. They hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So, 
as we aggressively pursue the things of God, the kingdom of God, our calling, the path in which God has placed us on, we do it aggressively, knowing that as we go, we're going to experience opposition, but we have a mindset that that opposition is not going to succeed, no matter where it comes from, no matter what it does. The Lord Jesus set the example. Every single thing in this world was against him. His own people, the Israelites, his own family, even his mother doubted him and allowed her other sons to talk her into coming in and try to talk him out of going into continuing his ministry. The government was against him. They put him on trial in front of Pilate. Everything in the world was against him. He did not allow that to influence him. The world kept trying to make him conform to the world system. The scribes and the Pharisees would consistently confront him to do this or to do that. He never once yielded to the pressure of the world. Neither should we. He was victorious over all attempts to try to deviate him from the path God had him on, to try to put thoughts and doubts in his mind. Since he overcame, we are walking the same path. We are guaranteed victory because he purchased it for us. All we have to do is to be aggressive and believe that God will change the circumstance, and he will. Turn to Jude, third chapter. <coughs> I mean, Jude, verse 3. There's no third chapter. <laughs> Jude, verse 3. I'll try to keep that in mind. Here, yeah, Jude pleads with the church to do something that they had been failing to do. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. When you become versed in the word of God, when it's in your spirit and you know it to be the word of God, do not let circumstances or people or anything lead you away from the truth of God's word. That's why the church went underground for a thousand years, they had the scriptures taken away from them, and suffered tremendously as a result. They would not contend for the faith, the body of teaching, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the same pressures are afoot in the world today. Christians are under pressure to compromise their belief, to be deceived out of what they know the scripture says, to believe something false, to believe something that's contrived, to believe anything but the truth of the word of God. Earnestly contend for the faith. Don't let what God has given you be taken away. And finally, we'll be, we want to go to Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. This is a pressure that will be with us until the Lord comes to take us out of this world. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove, but to the test, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The world is going to pressure you to try to conform to its priorities. It's going to present things in each saint's life 
to coerce the saint into compromising the truth of God's word for expediency. The world is going to consistently try to pressure each one of us into meeting its demand at the expense of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't allow that to happen. Don't compromise with the world system. Jesus never did, nor should we. Every day you're going to find pressure and as we go closer to the tribulation period, the time of the rapture, that pressure is going to be greater and greater and greater. We have what's known today as political correctness. You don't say things that aren't favorable lest you be ostracized, criticized, and basically you'll stand out as a person who is a bad person in the eyes of the world. That's going to become greater and greater and greater on God's people. Scripture tells us, do not conform to this world. You're going to see, unfortunately, many Christians cave, many Christians buckle under the pressure because they won't fly the principles that keep them free. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and do not become entangled again in the yoke of bindage. The world is out to bring Christians into conformity so that they can go into bondage to the things of the world. Do not allow that to happen to you. Pray unceasingly for the wisdom that God will give to deal with all the things that the enemy is going to manifest, consistently be in a state of prayer, communion, and communication with the Lord. Walk with him, talk with him, grow closer every day to him. That's our only guarantee of remaining free from the things that the world is going to try to heap upon us. In the end, when the Lord returns, or if we go to be with the Lord, we will be greatly rewarded in eternity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask, Lord, for your strength, for your wisdom. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in that which you have called us to perform. Help us, Lord, to be found faithfully doing the master's business when you call for us, when you come back to us. The Father will be sure to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory of all things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord.